Hi everybody, welcome to the Animal-Based Measures Assessment Webinar brought to you by Dairy Farmers of Ontario for ProAction Vet Advisors. Uh, with you today is Dr. Stephen Roach and myself, Dr. Kelly Barrett, and we will be presenting to you everything that you need to know about the Animal-Based Measures Assessment part of the ProAction Animal Care theme. The objectives of the webinar are to review the ProAction timelines, roles and responsibilities of veterinary advisors, also to review the animal-based measure protocols, and to address commonly asked questions. So we want to start by talking about the roles and responsibilities of the main stakeholders involved in ProAction in Ontario. The first of which is obviously Dairy Farmers of Ontario. Their job here is to administer ProAction in Ontario, which is laid out by the Dairy Farmers of Canada for the entire uh, country. The uh, DFO's other job is to validate producer compliance, and they're doing this through the form of FSRs, or field service reps, and these FSRs are acting as validators for this program. Farmers are obviously a key stakeholder in this process, and their job is to understand and comply with all of the requirements set out for each theme as part of the ProAction program. The other big one is veterinarians, you. This is, um, you have the opportunity to become trained as ProAction advisors through DFO, and your job here as an advisor is to deliver producer classroom sessions as per the Memorandum of Understanding or the MOU that you would have signed uh, while you completed the ProAction advisor training. The third thing here is to provide on-farm guidance as a user pay service when requested by clients. So you'll remember that DFO has set out an, a certain amount of funding uh, for ProAction advisors to, to take their clients through classroom training to educate them and prepare them for ProAction. Now as part of your professional services, you can actually uh, go beyond that and help your clients out uh, in any way you see fit, fit or they see fit on the farm and that again would be a user pay service. The final stakeholder we want to talk about here is Holstein Canada. Their job for the first two years of this program is to assess the animal-based measures on all farms. This is the focus of the uh, webinar today. Like I said, they are under contract for the first two years and at that time DFC is going to open things up and it may be a different uh, stakeholder or set of stakeholders that are eligible to complete the animal-based measures on dairy farms in Canada, but at this current point in time, Holstein Canada will be completing the animal-based measures assessment. So again, we, there's some terminology, some language, we would just wanna get very clear right up front here. As per ProAction and moving forward, veterinarians are known as advisors for ProAction. DFO FSRs or field service reps are known as validators and Holstein Canada classifiers are known as assessors. This language is important when reading any of the ProAction advisor uh, handbook material that we've prepared for you as part of DFO and certainly some of the presentations and webinars like today that Kelly and I will be delivering. So just to be really clear here, DFO FSR, FSRs or validators, their job is to perform the on-farm audit to determine the level of compliance as set out by the requirements for DFC. So again, they're looking at all of the requirements of the themes of ProAction and uh, those themes come into play or are implemented in different strategies or different timelines and we'll talk about those in a moment. Holstein Canada classifiers or assessors, their job is simply to conduct the animal-based measures assessment. So that's solely their job. They're focusing on this requirement, which happens to be part of animal care, and it's specifically requirement number 15. So in terms of timelines, like I mentioned already, the themes of ProAction are rolling out in a stepwise manner. They're starting with milk quality and food safety, which are already in place uh, here in Ontario. The next two themes, the new themes of ProAction are animal care and livestock traceability. These come into play in September of 2017, followed by biosecurity, which is coming into play in September 2019, which is then followed by the implementation of environmental sustainability or environment, and this is in September 2021. And the key message here is that all producers must be compliant on these dates, regardless of their validation date. So a little bit more on implementation with respect to animal care and livestock traceability. Again, happening in September of 2017, ProAction validation follows the existing CQM schedule. So on September 1st of 2017, a producer will now have grade A inspections and be validated for CQM, animal care, and traceability. And every visit after that will include these four themes until we start to implement biosecurity and then environment, in which it would be added on to the themes that are already discussed here. Now, the animal-based measures component must be complete ahead of the validation. 
and it must be complete within 24 months leading up to the validation in years one and two. Again, these are the years where Holstein Canada is acting as assessors. In year three and beyond, the actual animal-based measures assessment must be completed uh, 12 months leading up to the validation. The reason for the difference here is we're focused on getting as much data as we can early on in the program to start benchmarking Canada's dairy herd. We want to understand where herds uh, benchmark or where they actually sit with respect to number of hawk injuries, for example, per, uh, proportion of the herd that is lame. So all of these pieces go into how they're actually going, uh, producers are actually going to be validated uh, and whether or not corrective action is required. We'll talk about the specifics of those in a moment, but right now you need to know that there are differences in terms of when they must be completed, 24 months leading up to the validation in the first two years and 12 months leading up to validation in year three and beyond. And remember here that the first two years are benchmarking only. We want producers simply to be completing the animal-based measures assessment so we can collect that data and then start to make decisions about whether or not corrective actions are required. And we'll talk more again about the specifics of how that's going to be implemented and evaluated moving forward. We're going to start by looking at the animal care theme from a very high level. If you remember back to your animal, um, your ProAction Advisor Manual, we talked about the animal care at a glance. If you refer to page 104 of this manual, you will see all of the requirements laid out in a very concise format. These requirements address the following areas, housing, feed and water, animal health, handling and shipping, and staff training and communication. And also you can recall that there are five major minor requirements in this theme and 15 demerit point based requirements. When it comes to on-farm assessment, there are three main forms of assessment. The first is visual observation and interviews. This type of assessment will be done by the FSRs when they come to the farm. They'll be looking around, discussing the requirements with the individual producers and determining the level of compliance for those requirements. The second type of on-farm assessment is looking at the standard operating procedures. The expectation is, is that these will be completed in advance of the validation and the FSR or validator will be able to have a look at these uh, even before arriving at the farm. The standard operating procedures that are required for the animal care theme include colostrum management and calf feeding, animal health practices and branding, including disbudding, dehorning, castration, and supernumerary teat removal. Also, there are standard operating procedures for euthanasia and shipping cattle. The final form of on-farm assessment that's used for this theme is the animal-based measures, which is what we're focusing on today. They will be assessing the injuries of the animals, including hocks, knees, and necks, body condition score, and lameness. Holstein Canada classifiers are the assessors that have been selected nationwide to conduct the animal-based measures assessment. The validator, or FSR, will look for completion of this assessment, what the score and written corrective action plans are, if they're necessary. Initially, there will be a 10 to 12 month lag time getting enough data collected to be able to benchmark uh, the producers against each other, which is the determining point as to who needs to have a corrective action plan. So let's get right into the animal-based measures. The animal-based measures refers to animal care requirement number 15. It reads as follows. Do you evaluate the milking herd, so lactating cattle only, for body condition score, hawk, knee, and neck injuries, and lameness, and do you keep records of these results and take corrective action if the herd scores are in the yellow or red zones? And we'll get into more details about exactly what the yellow and red zones um, means later on. For assessment logistics, the Holstein Canada classifiers will be completing the assessments for the first two years. For those clients that are already existing classification clients, the assessment will be done during a classification visit at no additional charge. For those farmers that are not currently classifi classifying their animals, there will be a $100 call fee plus $6 per cow assessed for those clients. There are a series of qualifications that were outlined by DFC prior to the selection of Holstein Canada classifiers as the assessors. These qualifications essentially make someone or a group of, of service providers eligible to be performing the assessments in general. 
These requirement or these qualifications that make them eligible include the following. First, they have to have some level of education and experience, ideally a combination of post-secondary education and on-farm experience. Secondly, they would need to attend uh, and complete a Dairy Farmers of Canada-led assessor course. This course was a three-day course that was provided for Holstein Canada um, that for the classifiers, and during this course, they would the assessors would also need to re- achieve a certain level of reliability. The level of reliability required would be 80% or better on all measures. Finally, they would also need to maintain and upgrade any training and education that would be required by the program. They would also need to maintain their level of reliability, um, and so there would be consistency training at regular intervals. As I said, the DFC uh, assessor course was provided to the Holstein classifiers uh, already this year. It was done er early June 2016, and it was led by Clemence Nash on behalf of Dairy Farmers of Canada. Here you can see Clem's contact information. So the assessor role itself, the expectations from DFC, is that the assessor will objectively evaluate a sample of the herd for the animal-based measures. They need to provide a report to the farmers and explain what it means. Also, they need to direct farmers to the provincial coordinators should they have any questions. As always, uh, anyone representing DFC needs to, uh, and DFO needs to be professional, positive, pleasant, and ethical. The animal-based assessment starts in September of 2016 and Holstein Canada will be contacting all producers directly with a letter asking them to provide the following information. They'll be looking to find out what their herd size is, milking system, milking times, etc. As well, they'll need to indicate three convenient dates that would work for that producer to have an assessment performed. So we're going to jump into a bit more of the specific logistics now when it comes to conducting the animal-based measures assessment, and that starts by selecting the animals in the first place. So the number of cows or the sample size chosen is based on table one, which happens to be in your ProAction Advisor handbook or manual, and it's also in the the, uh, vet reference manual and workbook that DFC has provided. We'll speak speak, uh, specifically about some of the uh, characteristics of this table and how these numbers were uh, evaluated or generated in just a moment. Um, Moving forward from that, the sample of cows, whatever number of cows you actually need to choose or Holstein classifiers need to choose, must be selected randomly. Classifying clients may be provided with a list of random selections ahead of time, up to 24 hours ahead of time in fact, where these uh, clients will actually receive a list and say these are the following animals that are going to be, have been randomly selected and are going to be evaluated for animal based measures. If no list is provided to your clients, then a quick calculation is going to be done by the assessor upon arrival to ensure that they're going to select animals using systematic random sampling. And again, we'll speak about the uh, specifics of this in a moment. Now, each cow must be evaluated for all of the measures, so all three types of injuries, body condition scoring, and lameness, and it must be part of the lactating herd, so dry cows are excluded here. So let's look at table one that I mentioned just a minute ago. This has been generated by the Dairy Farmers of Canada and is what assessors will be using in all provinces in order to select animals. On the far left column, we have the average number of cattle in the milking herd. So this is lactating and dry animals here. And this is going from less than 20 animals all the way to more than 1,000. The middle column here is the sample size itself, which is the minimum number of cattle chosen for the assessment. So you see this ranks from uh, 14 all the way to 5%, 5% being um, of a herd that is 1,000 animals or larger. Now the last column on the right-hand side, this is approximately every blank animal. So for example, the first row here, approximately every second animal or all to every second animal if there are less than 20. So essentially what we're trying to do here is ensure that there's a random process to choosing the animals. Now the values that are chosen or the numbers that you see here really start by um, with the assumptions that we make. So in the bottom area in the red box you see a note. Sample sizes are calculated on the basis of 95% confidence level and a margin of error of 15 except for herd sizes over a thousand cattle. So what this means here in the text you see in the middle of your screen, 
The sample size is the minimum number of cattle we need to select in each herd in order to be able to say with 95% certainty that the value falls within a range of 15 points, 15 percentage points in this case, so plus or minus 15 around the value that we get or the score that we get. So if we got a point estimate or a score of 20% injured hawks in a particular herd, we are essentially saying that we are 95% confident that the true value lies between 5% and 35%. Now, we often uh, get the question from different advisors, you know, why do small herds actually have to uh, sample a higher proportion of the herd than larger herds? Why don't we all have to select, say, 20% of our animals in order to be able to say an uh, appropriate score? And that really comes down to the beauty of random sampling and statistical inference. And we're going to talk briefly about some of those concepts now in order to, uh, for you to be able to explain this to your clients. So in small herds, we need most animals to gain an accurate estimate. It's simply if there is say one animal that it happens to be lame out of 20, it's gonna be difficult to find that animal if we don't sample a high proportion of the, uh, of the herd. In larger herds, we need to sample more animals, so more animals than we're sampling in some of these smaller herds, for example, but a smaller proportion of the herd itself in order to have the same chance of gaining that accurate estimate. So our note at the bottom is essentially saying we're using the same parameters or the same assumptions regardless of the size of the herd. And that determines how many animals we actually need to select from each herd. If we're a small herd, then we need to sample a high proportion. And as that herd gets larger, we actually still select more animals, but are sampling a, a relatively smaller proportion of the herd overall to get the same accurate estimate. So let's put this into context. Let's say a herd has 20% lameness. That's four cows in a 20 head herd and 18 cows in a 90 head herd. It's going to be more easy to find a, um, a, a cow that's got lameness in the 90 head herd than it is in the 20 head herd. So we need to sample fewer cows at the end of the day, but still more cows than we are in the small herd in order to get the same accurate estimate. So in other words, with small herds, it's harder to gain an accurate picture without taking a large sample, a high percentage of the herd. But with larger herds, we can achieve the same level of accuracy, the one that's in the red box below, with a smaller proportion of the herd. Again, we're still selecting more cows than the small herd. So it really comes down to how much of the, uh, what proportion of the herd do we need to sample. Now, I just want to talk briefly about how we ensure we're getting these animals randomly. If we're not using a random number generator or the assessors aren't using a random number generator by looking at a number, a list of cow IDs, for example, and choosing them randomly, then we use a systematic random, uh, sample, random sampling process. So look at the red box or the red row here. We have the average number of cattle in the milking herd, say it's 30. And the sample size, therefore, we need to get 18. And the result we get is that we need to choose approximately every second animal. Well, the assessor is going to do some simple math to determine this or eventually, essentially use this chart. They're going to divide the herd size by the sample size in order to determine the sampling interval that they'll use. So the herd size 30, sample size is 18, and 30 divided by 18 equals 1.67. You can't have 0.67 of a cow, so we round up to two, and that's essentially what we're doing. We're sampling every second cow, and this ensures that we're using a random process. So, sampling protocol. First thing assessor is going to do when they get on the farm is they're gonna record the number of cows in the sick pen or identified as sick in tie stalls. The second thing they're going to do is choose the animal and record the ID. The sample selection again is going to be completely random and the important point here is that it's completely independent of classification status. These animals are being selected exclusively for the animal based measures assessment. For tie stalls, it's a fairly straightforward process. The assessor is going to choose every nth cow, so every second cow for example, in the row based on the sample size chart. For free stalls, it's a little bit different. There are several methods to choose cows, and we want you to we want assessors to use one of the following, and they are ordered by preference. The top point is the most preferred option to choose animals, and the bottom point here is the least preferred option. But recognizing that there are different situations where certain types of uh, selection is going to work, different uh, opportunities or options have been provided. So the first uh, preferred, most preferred option here is to choose uh, cows during milking or by moving cattle through the parlor in between milkings and releasing them through the return alley. The second or second most preferred option is after milking with cows secured in headlocks and then released. Third is between milkings with cows crowded in one end of the pen. 
And fourth would be choosing animals uh, between milkings and free stalls or bedded packs and individually searching for those cows. So once those animals are selected, the assessors are going to score injuries, so hocks, knees, and neck, and then they are going to score lameness and body condition score. An important point here is that in tie stalls, Clem Nash is recommended to score lameness first. And this, there needs to be a bit of common sense used around this. We, for the install lameness assessment, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, it was validated based on the animal standing for a specific period of time and then being able to be, observe specific behaviors that were indicator, indicators of lameness. So the key point here is that we don't want these animals to be anticipating anything such as feed and we don't them to want them to be overly stressed. So if it happens that an assessor comes in and all of the cows are resting comf comfortably in their stalls, then they're going to be uh, prompted to get up and then lameness will be conducted first. The assessment for lameness will be conducted first in order to ensure that that's done appropriately and using the appropriate uh, validation stra uh, strategy. And following that, all of the other measures will be done. So lameness for all of the animals first, followed by injuries and body condition score. When it comes to scoring, there has been a little change as to how uh, the terminology is going to be used. So animals are now going to be scored as either acceptable or as a requires corrective action. In the original documents as, or the workbook and manual, this was termed as unacceptable. But as you can imagine, this can often come with a little bit of a negative connotation to it, not only for um, the general public, but also to producers in general. So there's been, a, um, I think, a very positive move here um, to change the terminology to either as acceptable or as requires corrective action. Now we have a couple of examples of uh, first draft uh, summary sheets that's going to be used by Holstein Canada. Um, there may be some future changes to these documents, but this is the general gist of the type of information that Holstein Canada will be recording and then documenting and also leaving for the producer to be able to um, give to his various service providers and, and keep as a record um, for his, for his on-farm uh, validation. So as you can see, uh, they're going to be recording the animal ID. Then they'll also be documenting what the body condition score, was it acceptable or requires corrective action. For each of the injuries, uh, they'll also be able to identify particular um, parts of the body that were either acceptable or requires corrective action. And this may assist them in, in addressing those particular cows uh, needs or ways to improve over, the, over time in the future. And then also for the lameness assessment, is it acceptable or is it requires corrective action? And you can see that there's a difference from the uh, one that we were just looking at for free stalls to this one here that's for tie stalls. The tie stall one looks as though it has more information where in fact it's just uh, a, the lameness assessment is somewhat different and we're gonna go over um, exactly how the install lameness is, differs from the gate evaluation. Um, but you can see here that there are four measures for stall lameness and they need to, um, if they happen to be requires corrective action for two or more of those um, those items, they will then automatically be deemed as a required corrective action for that entire animal for that lameness assessment. So we'll start with body condition scoring as one of the measures uh, used in the assessment. Here you can see a uh, chart or a diagram that is provided by uh, Alanco. And you can see here the cows ranging um, between 2.75 on the left and 2.0 on the right. And the, the very important point here is that a body condition score of two or less is a requires corrective action and anything greater than two is deemed as acceptable. So here's a, a summary table um, showing the, what exactly is the difference between each uh, quarter point going from three all the way down to less than two. So from acceptable being anything greater than two and requires corrective action being a two or less. And if you focus here uh, on the ribs section uh, the, uh, where the red line divides the table, um, you can see that the difference between a 2.25 and a 2.0 is focusing in on the corrugations that are visible on the short ribs. So if there is fat cover over the short ribs, halfway between the tip of the short rib and where the spine is, that would be a 2.25. But if the fat cover is 
only visible is is uh, only one quarter of the way. So in other words, that there are corrugations visible three quarters of the way from the tip of the short rib towards the spine, then that score is going to be a two. So anything that is a two or less is a requires corrective action. So we're gonna go through a series of, of pictures here and give you an opportunity to have a look at that, come up with uh, an idea in your mind of how you would score that animal and then we're going to uh, take up the findings as was presented um, during the assessor training done by Dairy Farmers of Canada. So the first cow here would be a score of two. You can see that the, there are corrugations um, along the short ribs and we're going to put some clicker points on here um, to demonstrate where exactly the um, corrugations are, but you can see from the tip of the short rib moving up towards the spine, the corrugations along here are visible the, are visible three quarters of the way uh, from the tip of the short rib towards the spine, and therefore this cow would be a score of two. There are also prominent hooks and pins, and the base of the tail is also sunken. So this cow would be a requires corrective action. The next picture, is a very different cow. And this cow would be a score of five. The first question here is, well, we, where are the short ribs? This cow has quite a lot of fat cover over those short ribs and no corrugations are visible. Also, the hooks and pins are very round and the base of the tail is buried in fat. Now for cow number three. This cow would be a score of three. The short ribs are not visible. The hooks and pins are visible, but they're smooth, and the base of the tail is somewhat hollow, but the skin folds are not distinct. This cow would be acceptable. And I do appreciate uh, that this is much easier to do on live cows than it is to do on images, um, but it's also very important to look at a, a variety of, of different types of cows and get practice in doing it. Here's cow number four. So this cow would be a score of less than two or a requires corrective action. The corrugations on the short ribs extend all the way from the tips of the short rib to the spine. The hooks and pins are very sharply defined, the base of the tail is somewhat hollow and sunken, and the backbone vertebrae are also prominent. Okay, so now we're going to look at hawk injuries. In terms of scoring of hawk injuries, there's a couple things to note here. The first thing is that um, both hawks are scored independently and the worst score is recorded. So if a cow has a one, uh, one hawk that looks good and is acceptable and one that requires corrective action, that cow is marked as requiring corrective action overall. Now the ordinal scale that you might be used to, which is zero to three, zero indicating no swelling, really good looking hawk, and three indicating major swelling in a, in a very severely um, injured hawk, such as you see in the picture there, has been changed by DFC into a dichotomous scale. So zero and one are effectively acceptable hawks, and twos and threes are now requires corrective action. The major difference here is the amount of swelling. So in a one, we have no swelling or minor swelling, less than a centimeter on the lateral side of the hawk. And for the twos and threes, we have median, moderate swelling to major swelling. So this is anything larger than one centimeter, again, off the lateral side of the hawk. The other big area here is that while there might be some hair loss, we're not totally worried about that. The main thing here is, is there evidence of a lesion? So in twos and threes or animals requiring corrective action for hawks, we're looking for moderate swelling or worse and a bald area that would actually have a lesion in it or evidence of a lesion. So again, as I've mentioned here, we're scoring the lateral side of the hawk and really we're looking at the area within the red box here that you see in the image. Nothing outside of this box uh, is what we're going to be scoring. Everything inside is what we're after. In terms of dirty hawks, sometimes we have animals that are going to be difficult to score because they are, hawks are dirty. If less than 20% are too dirty, then we're going to replace those with other cows. So the assessor is actually going to deem, is this hawk too dirty to score? And if so, all of the measures on that animal are going to be erased or no longer completed and a new animal is selected and all of the measures, not just hawk injuries, will be evaluated on that new animal. 
If more than 20% are too dirty, then hawks are marked as requiring corrective action. This is really a logistical thing here to make sure that the animals are going to be clean enough in order to, to grade them. And so this is um, ultimately uh, a consequence of, of having more than 20% hawks too dirty at this case. So here's cow number one for a review. So cow number one would require corrective action. You can see small lesions visible here in the bald area. There's no significant swelling, although it does look a little bit painful and, and pink. Um, the fact that there's a, a bald area is not overly significant for us in terms of why we determine it requires corrective action. It's the presence of lesions here that really are indicative of that fact. Cow number two. And as you might expect, this hawk looks pretty good. The score would be acceptable. No swelling and minimal hair loss. Cow number three here. So cow three is a bit of the trick one. Uh, the score here, it's too dirty to score. So again, reminder of what's happening here. The assessor is going to look at this and say, okay, well, this is if this is a one-off uh, situation or certainly less than 20% of the hawks that need to be evaluated are too dirty, then a new animal is going to be chosen. However, if more than 20% are too dirty, then this animal is going to be deemed to require corrective action and they will move on. Cow number four now. So cow number four would require corrective action. There is evidence of a lesion within the red box here. Now, if I kind of take my mouse and show you that red box a little bit, you can fall down. This major scab here or lesion probably doesn't fall quite within the red box if we're really being critical about it. But as I move forward down, you can see that there is some obvious swelling and we do probably have a smaller lesion here. This bigger one here is showing me also, okay, well, this is likely gonna be a lesion and, and probably a painful hawk. This area here is not going to fall within the red box and therefore not going to be part of our decision on whether or not this animal requires corrective action. But again, given the obvious swelling, I would say medium to moderate swelling and the fact that there are lesions within this red box, this animal would be deemed to require corrective action. Count number five now. So cow number five would require corrective action. And again, we're looking at one hawk here, not both of them, at least in this specific picture. And the, the comment here is that if one hawk out of the two requires corrective action, then the animal is deemed to require corrective action. And here you see that because there is moderate swelling. So this is going to be probably a two and there is hair loss, but no lesions evident. So again, requiring corrective action here. So count number six here, we would give a score of requiring corrective action. There's marked swelling here. So that's enough to say that it's going to be requiring corrective action, but it's also a visible lesion here. The question mark here about potential um, manure, um, actually covering that up or making that look like a lesion when it's not in fact. Um, but in, in terms of the scoring overall, the swelling is enough to indicate that it requi requires corrective action, but something to just take note of, is it a lesion? Is it manure? Uh, again, Kelly mentioned the, uh, the point about seeing things in real life versus seeing them in still images makes it a little bit difficult. But again, just to show those differences, it might be manure. That's something that might be investigated further. But again, the swelling itself shows that this animal re would require corrective action. So we're going to move on to the next measure that's going to be assessed, and that is knee injuries. Very similar to hawk injuries, it has been divided into a dichotomous scale. So uh, there are actually four different levels of knee injuries that are going to be um, categorized, two of which are going to be deemed as acceptable and two are requires corrective action. So a score of zero or one would be that there is no swelling and there may be a bald area, but there are no lesions and a score of requires corrective action would be a score of two or three, indicating that there could be broken skin or a scab and or any swelling, but they may have a bald area, or that there is major swelling. So you can see on that um, bottom right-hand corner that knee is quite swollen. So with knees, a little bit different than hawks. Hawks are allowed to have a little bit of swelling and still be okay, but knee injuries are not. The moment that there is any swelling at all, it becomes a requires corrective action. Also, the moment that there is a lesion, 
it becomes or requires corrective action. Once again, the both knees will be assessed and the worst score is the one that uh, trumps the other one. So here is cow number one. This cow would be scored as acceptable. There is no swelling and there are no visible lesions. Cow number two would also score as acceptable. There is no swelling and again, no visible lesions. Cow number three would be a requires corrective action. You can see that her left front knee has significant swelling and there is a lesion visible. Cow number four would be a requires corrective action. We're gonna be looking at both knees. The first knee doesn't look too bad, there's no swelling. However, the far knee or her right front knee has marked swelling even though there are no lesions visible. Again, as soon as there is any swelling on a knee, it jumps into the requires corrective action category. Cow number five is also a requires corrective action. Despite there not being any swelling at all evident, you can see visible lesions on the, on the knees of both front knees um, that, that would um, give it this requires corrective action designation. So now we'll go into the last of the injuries, which is neck injuries. Scoring for neck injuries is a little bit uh, more straightforward. Um, there is still the acceptable and requires corrective action. In terms of the ordinal scale, you're typically going from zero to two. So zero looks like uh, no swelling, no hair is missing. There might be some hair loss or broken hair, but generally looks very good, very healthy. Um, uh, one is a no swelling or the bald area might be visible, but again, the absence of swelling is the key here. So zero and one, or what I've just explained, is known as acceptable. And moving into requiring corrective action is essentially evidence of lesion, so a broken skin, scab. And then the other key here is swelling. Just like knees, as soon as we get swelling, this animal is going to be marked as requiring corrective action. It may have a bald area, that's okay. Again, it's lesions and or swelling that we're focused on. So cow number one, Cow number one is obviously uh, an acceptable animal. There is no swelling here and no lesions. Looks good. There's a tiny bit of hair loss here, but nothing uh, of concern in terms of swelling or lesions. Cow number two. So cow number two would require corrective action. We have visible swelling here, no lesions that we can see, but again, uh, just swelling alone is enough to uh, cross over from acceptable to requiring corrective action, and therefore you get uh, uh, marked it down as an R in this case, requiring corrective action. Cow number three. So cow number three is more obvious that this animal requires corrective action. You see severe swelling ar around the neck here. No lesions to speak of, but swelling is enough to indicate it needs requiring correct or requires corrective action. Cow number four. So cow number four would be scored as acceptable. You see a bald area there, but um, it's really no obvious swelling and no lesions, so this animal will be marked as acceptable. And cow number five. So she would be marked as requiring corrective action. You see severe swelling here. Again, no lesions, but the swelling is enough to require corrective action. The final animal-based measure that Holstein Canada assessors are going to be looking at is cattle lameness. The first um, aspect of cattle lameness that we're going to look at is gait scoring. So gait scoring is done with this uh, chart that was developed by the University of British Columbia Animal Welfare Program. And you'll see that it's a scale of one to five with a score of one being a completely sound cow with smooth and fluid movement, all the way through to a score of five, which is a severely lame cow, where her ability to move is severely restricted and she must be vigorously encouraged to stand and or to move. Scores of one and two are very sound cows 
and they are deemed to be acceptable. The opposite end of the spectrum, the scores four and five, are very obviously lame cows, and these are deemed as requires corrective action. As with anything, and particularly with gait scoring, there is a gray area, and these would be the, sc the cows that would be a, a gait score of three. These animals are capable of moving, however, their ability to move is somewhat compromised. So their back might be flat or mildly arched when they're standing, however, when they go to move, it's obviously arched. There would be a slight limp, could be discerned in one or more limbs, and there would be some um, evidence of joints being stiff or um, not able to move freely. For the purposes of a proaction, um, the main point here is to identify the extremes. So as you saw with body condition scoring, we were looking for those extremely thin cows that would be deemed as a requires corrective action. And the same thing applies here for gait scoring. The extreme cows of the scores four and five are going to be requires corrective action and everything else is going to be deemed in the acceptable category. So one and two is an obvious acceptable. Threes are also going to be considered acceptable. However, they are going to be um, identified or flagged for the producer as a monitor because they're clearly not perfectly sound and may require um, some attention. However, um, they're going to be lumped in with the acceptable score cows. So when you're doing gait scoring, uh, it's very important that it's done in a suitable location. So a transfer alley between the parlor and the pen works very well. Uh, the surface needs to be smooth and flat. Uh, avoid any slatted concrete or sloping surfaces such as um, as they're coming down from the parlor or through a foot bath. Any time where they're going to have to take a step or make a turn should be avoided. They need to be observed for a minimum of four strides in order to get a good assessment. And the score for the presence or absence of an obvious limp is as follows. Acceptable is going to be no obvious limp present. The monitors are also acceptable and they would have a mild or moderate limp only. And the requires corrective action cows are those that have an obvious or severe limp present. Now we're going to um, share with you a gait scoring video that was developed by Clem Nash and um, there is currently no audio uh, associated with that. It's just hot off the press. Um, so, but during this video, there's some great text to go along um, and it's going to show you each of the different scoring uh, for the cattle videos.
Now we're going to move on to the install lameness assessment protocol. Ideally, this would be the first measure to be assessed on the farm. Cows must be standing for at least three minutes before this assessment is performed, and we need to avoid assessing cows when they are anticipating something, such as a waiting feed or milking. If a cow defecates or urinates during the assessment, disregard any behaviors five seconds before and five seconds after the event. Also, it's important that the assessor is positioned in a way that they can observe all four feet and to be able to stand there to observe for a full 90 seconds. It's important to remember that whenever you are uh, making your assessment, to consider a cow to be lame, a cow must show at least two of the following four behaviors. The four behaviors of lameness uh, for the install lameness assessment include standing on edge, weight shift, uneven weight or rest, and uneven movement. These are going to be explained uh, very well in a video that we're going to show you momentarily. First, I wanted to show you a static image of the um, edge or standing on edge behavior that some cows in tie stalls will do. You can see here that the cow is standing right at the very back of the stall so that the heel is actually um, hanging off the edge uh, or, or the, is non-weight bearing. And this is just to relieve some pressure um, to those uh, caudal heel um, tissues uh, in case there is any pain associated with that. So that's really the only thing we can show you as a static image. Everything else uh, will be shown uh, in a video. So this video, again, it was um, created by uh, Dr. Stephanie Croyle, and um, you'll hear her, she's the one that is narrating it. It's excellent, it goes through in great detail, explaining each of the um, install lameness indicators. Hi, and welcome to Canada's National Dairy Study Technique video for stall lameness scoring. This video was brought to you by funding from Dairy Research Cluster 1 and 2. This video is not meant to be a training video, but rather it is meant to familiarize you with install behavioral indicators of lameness. These behaviors include rest, shift, edge, and uneven steps. Remember, in order for a cow to be considered lame, she must show at least two of these four behaviors. Before we begin showing examples of these behaviors, Let's go over some basic principles first. Stall lameness assessments can only be done after cows have been standing for at least three minutes. So for example, if you see that cows are lying down, you should stand them up at least three minutes before scoring. Avoid recording cows when they are anticipating something such as feedings or milking. This is because Cows might be changing behavior due to excitement. It is important to stand where you can see all four feet and watch for 90 seconds. If the cow urinates or defecates, disregard any behavioral indicators that occur five seconds before or after the excrement. Only record behavioral indicators once the cow has returned to normal standing posture. Now we will review the four behaviors to look for during the 90 second observation window. First, we will describe and show examples for the behavioral indicator rest. A rest is when the cow picks up one hoof or part of one hoof off the ground and returns it to the same position. This does not apply for licking or kicking behavior. In this example, you can see the cow first takes a step backwards slightly. This is not a rest. Following this, she lifts her foot up and directly places it back down. This is a rest right here. In this next example, we see the cow lift up the back of her hoof and place it back down in the same position. This is still considered a rest. In this example, the cow clearly picks up her foot and places it directly back down in the same position. In this example, the cow picks up her right foot and places it back down in the same position.
This last example is not a rest. The cow picks up her foot and moves it backward before placing it back down. Let's watch her take that step backward again. Next, we will describe and provide examples of the behavioral indicator shift. A shift is a four beat process, either right, left, right, left, or left, right, left, right. Regular repeated shifting of weight from one hoof to the other. Repeated shifting is defined by lifting each hoof off the ground at least twice. In this example of a shift, you see the cow pick up her left foot, then right, then left, then right again. In this example, which is not a shift, you see the cow do three beats, right, left, right. Next, we will describe and provide examples of the behavioral indicator edge. An edge is described as the placement of part of one hoof off the edge of the stall while standing stationary. This can be one or both hooves. In this example of an edge, we see that the cow has her left foot partially on the mat and her heel off of the mat. This is considered an edge. In this next example, this cow also has her left foot partially on the mat and her heel hanging off the edge, hence why we call it an edge behavior. For our last behavioral indicator, we will describe and show examples of uneven steps. For uneven steps to be identified, one person shifts the cow left to right while the other person observes for uneven steps. This behavior is described as uneven weight bearing between hooves when the cow is encouraged to move side to side. This is demonstrated by greater rapid movement of one hoof relative to the other or by evident reluctance to bear weight on one limb. In this clip, we can see that the cow is choosing not to bear weight evenly. She is moving her right leg more rapidly in order to spend less time on the left leg. This cow would be considered uneven. This is considered one of the more challenging behaviors to identify. So let's watch it again. As we move the cow from left to right, we see that the cow is avoiding placing weight on her left leg while she moves the right more rapidly. Here is another example of uneven steps. In this clip, it is more challenging to decide which foot is uneven because both feet appear sore. She is taking short steps in order to minimize the time she spends bearing weight on only one foot. Once again, this can be difficult to identify, so let's watch it again. In this clip, it is more challenging to decide which foot is uneven because the cow is reluctant to bear weight on either foot. She is taking short steps in order to minimize the time she spends bearing weight on only one foot at a time. Remember, most importantly, a cow is only considered lame when she shows two of these four behaviors during the observation window. This video is brought to you by contributions from Dairy Cluster One Research. Video design and narration was by myself, Stephanie Croyle, and expertise for the video was brought by Clemence Nash. Funding was provided by Cluster 1 and 2, Dairy Farmers of Canada, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, the Canadian Dairy Network, and the Canadian Dairy Commission. This method was developed based off the Leach method from research collaborators at the University of Bristol. Detailed description can be found in the Animal Care Assessment Manual online through DFC. Okay, so now we're going to talk uh, for a few minutes about recording and reporting. We've mentioned before that for the first two years of uh, animal care and proaction, it's all about collecting data. So essentially your clients have to have the animal-based measures assessment completed by an assessor from Holstein Canada. 
Now, what's going to be used in order to evaluate whether or not uh, they you know, essentially meet the bar when it comes to uh, ideal targets for body condition score injuries like hawk's knees and neck and lameness, or whether or not they need to do something about it to improve, such as making a corrective action and implementing that, essentially a table is going to be used at this point in time. And they're going to be using percentiles, benchmarking Canada's dairy herd to try and understand, well, where does this herd rank overall in terms of the national picture? Over time, this will start to become ideally targets, specific targets. But right now, DFC is operating with this table. So on the far left-hand side, you have the measures, body condition score, the injuries, hocks, knees, and neck, and lameness. From there, moving over to the right-hand side, we have this excellent category. This really indicates the percentage of animals in a herd um, that if they meet this percentage, then you are actually going to be deemed as excellent in this case. So 95% animals having an acceptable body condition score would be deemed as ex ex excellent. Having 90% hawks or 10% hawks that are requiring corrective action or less, so 10% or less requiring corrective action, you're again, that herd would be deemed as excellent and so on and so forth all the way down. Now we're going to be using these colored zones to determine whether or not the herd actually needs to make a change or whether or not they fall in what we'll call an acceptable range. So the green is the best area. So the first percentile all the way up to the 25th percentile, these are the herds that have the fewest injuries or the best body condition score or the uh, best lameness. And by that, I mean the fewest lame cows and the, the fewest cows that are too skinny. And we don't want cows that are too fat either, right? We want them in that three zone. So moving from there, we have the yellow and red zones. And these are gonna require um, different things depending on which zone they fall in. If a herd falls in the yellow zone for any of the measures, this would be uh, falling between the 25th and 75th percentiles, uh, the uh, producer's actually going to be recommended to create a corrective action plan for the specific measure we're talking about, whether that be body condition scores, injuries, or lameness. Now, if the score falls in the red area for any of these measures, then a corrective action plan is actually going to be required. So Holstein Canada is going to complete the actual animal-based measures assessment and they're going to provide producers with their score. And then from there, they're going to say, well, you might fall into, or you do fall into one of these percentiles. Now, the FSR themselves is then going to come on um, to the farm later on when they're auditing, have you complied with uh, animal care in this case? And they're gonna say, okay, show me the score uh, that for the animal-based measures assessment. Show me you've done it, show me the score. And if you have anything in the yellow or red, show me um, a, a corrective action plan. Again, the difference here is if you're yellow, the corrective action plan is recommended. And in the red, the corrective action plan is required. So the FSR specifically wants to see that you've done it, what your score was, and if you're in the red, specifically in the red, then the corrective action plan needs to be there. Now, as Kelly mentioned before, for the first 10 to 12 months, we're not actually going to know what the values are. What is the 25th percentile? Well, we don't know yet. We need enough data um, coming from dairy farms in order to understand, well, what does that actually look like? What's the distribution of these various measures in Canada's dairy herd? And once we understand that, uh, the producers will start to be benchmarked. So if your client is going to be assessed in the first 10 to 12 months, they're not actually going to be given one of these percentiles. They're going to be essentially told, here's your score. And at a, a time uh, coming up, so after that 10 to 12 month uh, time period, you're going to be placed within the uh, percentiles or the distribution of these various measures. And at that time, they'll be able to understand whether they fall in the green, yellow, or red zones. If your client is going to be assessed beyond that 10 to 12 month time frame, the assessor themselves should be able to say, hey, here's your final score sheet with all of the tracking and reporting. Here's how many green, yellow, and reds you have, and uh, this is where you fall within Canada's dairy herd. Currently, there are no consequences for producers falling in these various zones. What we want producers to do is simply get the animal-based measures assessment completed and then from there obtain their score so they know where they're at. Now, the only time that there might be a consequence here is if the DFO FSR comes on the farm and the record of assessment, so the animal-based measures assessment itself hasn't been completed, so it must be completed before the FSR comes on during that CQM test date. And if, again, if they fall in the red zone, a corrective action plan must be there. And again, for the first 10 to 12 months, those producers aren't going to be able to know whether or not they fall in the green, yellow, or red zones. But you can use that excellent target as something to strive for and obviously something that will likely fall within the green zone as we move forward. 
Now, in terms of resources as an advisor, all of the resources that Kelly and I and DFO, as well as some of the resources DFC are putting together for you, are going to be accessible through the current Canadian Quality Milk uh, website. So www.canadianqualitymilk.org. You're going to be given, if you haven't already received, a Pro ProAction Advisor login ID. You'll actually log in using that ID and be able to access all of the PDF materials from there in order to instruct your clients as well as educate yourself on how the program is rolling out and what uh, components of the uh, program currently exist. So we'd just like to acknowledge a number of people and organizations that helped uh, make the webinar today possible and provided us with a number of the content and resources that we used in order to create what we've shown you here today. The pictures and the videos were collected through the Cow Comfort Cluster One project and through the Novus Cows program. We have a special thank you to Nicole Sillette, Maria Leal, and Clem Nash for providing us with many of the pictures and videos that you've seen here today. In terms of the funding that made this webinar specifically available, this project was funded in part through Growing Forward 2, a federal provincial territorial initiative. The Agricultural Adaptation Council assists in the delivery of GF2 in Ontario. And with that, that's everything we have for you. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and please uh, don't hesitate to contact Kelly or I if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Thanks. Talk to you soon.